Well, good morning, and welcome to our Memorial Day weekend service, but I'm so glad that you're here. It is so good to see people back in the sanctuary. I know this is our third service back in the sanctuary, but it's still so good to see you all. And I've been asked, when are we going to get to take the tape down to where you can all sit wherever you want to? I don't think we'll ever take the tape down because it forces you to sit towards the front and not hug the back pew. So we'll eventually get there, but it does look a whole lot better with you spread out and being closer to the front. And also I want to say welcome to those of you that are on Facebook Live with us. Thank you for being here with us on Facebook. And we do want to remind you that if you're at home and you would like to participate in the communion service with us, the only thing you need to do is have some kind of an element of bread or cracker and water or juice maybe there for you. And so as we uh, get to that part of the service, we do want to invite you to even partake of it even in your homes. And if you're in the parking lot, we're glad that you're here listening to us on the radio or by the loudspeakers. And uh, once again, if you need any of the communion elements, I know uh, Brother Billy Hawkins is out there in the parking lot right now passing out bulletins and the communion supplies. Be sure just to wave at him, get his attention, and he'll be glad to bring that to you as well. But once again, thank you for being here today and as we get ready to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us, uh, let us stand for the call to worship past the scripture and remain standing for the invocation that Karen will come and, and, and lead to us. Read with me, Psalms 25, verses 6 and 7. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. Now I want you to look at that verse of Scripture once again. The word remember is in there three times. And that is, he tells us, remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and unfailing love. It's not, O oh Lord, remember that I need a big bank account, a fast car, a big truck, a newer house. It's not that. The most important things in which we ever want God to remember is his compassionate and unfailing love and for also for him not to remember our rebellious sins. And when we think about that, what it is, is he wants to remember us in the light of his unfailing love through his son, Jesus Christ, not our failures. And we can experience that even this day as we seek his forgiveness and having a relationship with him. Karen, pray for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, and Lord, we do thank you for your compassion and your unfailing love towards each one of us. God, we thank you for what today symbolizes as we are observing Memorial Day. We thank you so much, God, and want to remember those that have given their lives, Lord, the men and women that gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have this freedom to be able to gather together today and worship you. God, and thank you so much for those that have protected our nation. Thank you for our nation, Lord, and may we truly turn back to you and humble ourselves, God, and trust you in all things. God, guide us through this time of worship. I pray, God, that you will be honored and glorified and lifted up, God, because we love you and we thank you for loving us and we thank you for the greatest gift that you ever gave us, and that's Jesus who did pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And it's in his precious name that I pray. Amen. Let's remain standing. We're going to sing One Thing Remains. This theme will keep coming back throughout the song. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never gives up on me. Constant through the trial and the change 
it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me.
enjoy and so often take for granted. Whenever we think about those rights and those privileges, we think about, well, I'm owed those things. Well, whenever we stop and we think about we might be in the feeling that we are owed those things, just remember that somebody else paid the price for that. Ever since the beginning of our nation, men and women have both volunteered and been drafted to protect these freedoms and these rights and these privileges in which we so much enjoy. And since the inception of our nation, over one million men and women have died on battlefields. Many of you all, whenever you came in, received the sheet of paper from the VA that had the statistics on it of the deaths of America, of Americans, brave young men and women who have died on various battlefields. Let us be reminded that we are still in raging war right now, where still people are dying. And let us not think that their deaths were ever in vain, regardless if you agreed with the political stance of the war or not. Let us be reminded that they were fighting for our freedoms and for our protection and for the privileges in which we so much enjoy. So on this Memorial Day weekend, let us not think about the barbecue we might have or the time at the lake or the friends or the family in which we might gather with. Those things are wonderful. And those who have perished and have paid the price for our freedoms, they would want us to enjoy life. But I encourage you to take a moment, especially tomorrow, at three o'clock, which is the official time of Memorial Day Remembrance. And pause and remember what it took for you to have the freedoms of our great nation. Pray for the families and the friends of those in whom have fallen on the battlefields. And also pray for our nation as a whole that one day we should all be able to rest in peace in our nation and there'll be no more wars waged. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer this day, I want us to bow our heads for a moment of silence and prayer as we listen once again to the sounding of taps and as we go before God and humbly giving him thanks for what we have here in our nation.
Father God, we come to you right now in this solemn moment. And Father, remembering that freedom is not free. And God, we come thanking you that, Lord, that you saw fit to bless our nation with these rights and the privileges in which we so much enjoy. Father, we also thank you that, God, that we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that, God, that over the time of our nation, that, Lord, that we have been able to know that we have ones that are willing to say, here am I, send to me. Father, that have protected our, our democracy, our republic. Father, that have given us the freedoms in which we so much enjoy. Now, Father, we do want to remember those, Father, that have fallen, Lord, on the battlefields, both near and far. Father, we pray, Lord, for their families, that God, as they remember on this date, as well as on their loved ones' birthdays, the date of their death, that God, that you would comfort them and continue, Lord, to show yourself to them in ways that God, that they might be able to be comforted by your Holy Spirit and your presence. Father, we also come remembering on this day, Lord, what it took for us to really be free and that was you giving us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, help us to be reminded that, Lord, that we might live in the land of the free, but God, we're not truly free until we've been set free by you. And you did that whenever your Son, Jesus, went to the cross and died for our sins. And God, we thank you, Lord, that we're able to come into your presence and, Father, experience true freedom from our sins and Lord, from our selfish ways, God, by releasing ourselves into your care, yielding ourselves unto you, surrendering ourselves to you, not to be imprisoned, but Lord, to be set free. God, we thank you this day that Lord, that truly we, your children, can experience real freedom. But God, we also want to remember our brothers and sisters, Father, that are... Uh, serving in other countries, Lord, not in the U.S. military, but God in your army. Father, protect them, we pray this day, as they want to tell other people in nations where the people do not have freedoms about how they can truly be free in you. Watch over them, protect them, bless them, Father, for fruits for their labors. And God, we once again want to tell you that we love you, we worship you, we adore you, because you are God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 15, 13 says this, read it aloud. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Remember that this Memorial Day, but remember this about the man named Jesus. Him says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful. My song shall ever be. Let's sing my Savior's love. Would you stand as we sing?
face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what could it be? Let's sing that song. my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ, who died for me, face to face I shall behold. take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 4, that's where we'll be this morning. On this Memorial Day weekend, as we remember our nation, our, and those who have fought so gallantly and died on battlefields, but also for us as Christians to be ever so remindful of God. You know, remembering things is that of somewhat an art. You know, I'm always amazed with people that can remember names of mass amount of people. I stand in awe of those kind of people. Now, I know that for me personally, I know that God has given me somewhat of a vivid memory my dad and my brother often laugh at me because I can remember details about things of my childhood and I can remember some of the most insignificant, unimportant details that my brain should not retain. And I can remember those things. I can still remember the very first phone number that we ever had from whenever, the very first place. And we moved around a lot whenever I was a kid. I still remember the zip code of that town. You know, and, and, and so I can remember those kinds of things, but yet sometimes I forget my own phone number today. And I can't even remember the zip code sometimes. Y'all ever have that problem? Well, let me tell you, I have been reading about how to improve your memory. And there's three things it's said to do. Number one is, is that if you want to remember something, say it out loud at least ten times. Say it out loud at least ten times and it'll help you to remember. Number two is write it down and write it repeatedly and it'll help you to remember. And I don't remember what the third one was. <laughs> but you know, we also have long-term memory, short-term memory, and something called selective memory. Now us men have that selective memory down pat. Because your wife sends you to the grocery store and you come back with less than what she told you to go and get, you had selected memory whenever you went to the store. But you know, whenever we stop and we think about those things about what we want to remember, sometimes it takes something for us to be able to put it before us so that we can reflect back on it and remember. Too often we as humans we'll remember the worst stuff 
first. We'll remember the bad times. We'll remember more about when that person hurt us. We'll remember what they said wrong. We'll remember when they did not do what we thought they should have done. We will reflect upon that more so than what we do, how blessed that we were by maybe what they did once or what they said or where they were. Instead of remembering the good things, sometimes we just only harp on the bad things. And we can also even do that about ourselves. For so often, we will only remember the bad things that we have done. And we will beat ourselves up over it repeatedly and we'll constantly just let that be what controls us and we'll constantly nag ourselves about, why did I do that? How did I do that? And we'll constantly remember those things. Instead of remembering that whenever, yeah, we as humans, we have sinned, every single one of us, but let us also remember that we have also been forgiven. Now, having a good good memory has its place in also helping us not to create and make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Sometimes we have scars that remind us that there are things that you should not be doing. Well, it wasn't a point of shouldn't be doing it. You know, you might needed to have done it. You might know that you were doing it, but yet you, you learned a lesson from it. And so we bear the scars, but thankfully the good thing is, is it heals. But as we look back on those things, Let us not be reminded as, woe is me and pity. But instead of, wow, I'm only glad it was that bad and it could have been a whole lot worse. So let us take some things in our life and let's put up some remembrances. You know, one of the greatest things that that, that which we have the privilege of being able to do here in America is this, to travel. You see, we don't really take, we don't think about the privilege in which we have with that. We can travel anywhere here in North America in which we want to go, anywhere here in the United States, and we do not have to go through checkpoints. We do not have to have a passport or a visa to be able to go from one state to another. And our interstate systems to where if you are of age and you have a driver's license and insurance, you can drive a vehicle for the most part on 99% of our roads without having to pay a toll. But yet you pay your taxes, I know. But I'm just saying to where the freedom to be able to go where you want, when you want, and how you want is a great privilege and honor and blessing that we need not ever take for granted. But you know what we often do whenever we're traveling to other places? We'll bring back mementos. Remember some of the mementos in which you have? I know that that in our home there are different things from different places in which we have traveled to that we bought that would serve as a little reminder of, oh yeah, you remember when we went and you remember whenever we, and you remember when we did, you know, and they serve as little reminders of so many places in which we went. Now, I hope that you have not gone to the extreme that Lucille Ball went to in the long, long, long trailer. Okay. Just out of curiosity, just so I know my crowd here, how many of you all are familiar with that old classic movie? All right. If, you, if you're looking for a really good movie to watch, watch the Lucy and Desi's movie called The Long, 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 Long Trailer. The essence of the, tra- of, of the movie is, is, that, is that, and I don't know what their names are in the movie, but, but Lucy and Desi buy a travel trailer, and they're traveling, and Lucy is enamored with rocks. And everywhere they stop, she picks up a rock and she puts it into the trailer. And the trailer becomes overweighted. And you'll just have to see the rest of it and see how it happens. In our household, we had a rock collector as well. Yes, Miss Heather. Heather was a rock collector. Remember those days, Karen? (laughs) Whenever Heather would come home, she would come home with rocks. And... Those rocks would often find themselves in a little rock garden beside our back door. And I'm not sure if we moved those rocks when we came to Greenville or not, but Heather used to collect the rocks. Well, you know, a rock is something that's often a memorial or or remembrance of 
a significant place or time or event in our lives. And if you stop and you even think about a rock serving as a memorial, just remember, tombstones are actually rocks. And so they serve as a memorial to those that are deceased and are, are, are there. And, and over this weekend, out of the thousands of tombstones in, in Arlington National Cemetery, the soldiers have gone and placed American flags at the head, to, at, at the tomb of each and every one of those soldiers. And all across our nation, there are people that are going to gravestones and placing flowers and flags this weekend for those that are veterans. Now, whenever we think about that, let us remember that back whenever this day, before it was actually called Memorial Day, and before it became a national holiday in 1971, it was actually called Remembrance Day or Decoration Day. And so as we go back and we think about those rocks and about how that we put those places in our minds, let us go back and think about some other stones. The children of Israel had been in captivity for some time. God raised up Moses. Moses had led them out of, the, out of captivity. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had come to the other side. They sinned. God punished them for 40 years. They wandered around in a circle before they were allowed to go into the promised land. And only very few of those who actually crossed the Red Sea were actually now going to be able to journey into the promised land. Moses had a servant who became a protege who then became the leader named Joshua that was actually going to lead them into the promised land. And in Joshua chapter uh, 1, we see where Moses dies, leader, uh, and, and the leader, and Joshua assumes the position. And then we saw where, or we are actually able to see where then Joshua sends the spies in, and we read the story about Rahab the harlot hiding the spies in Jericho. And then we see in chapter 3 where the Israelites crossed the Jordan. And there was a significant event about them crossing the Jordan because here again, it was one of those times whenever God parted the water for them to be able to get safely to the other side. And then in Joshua chapter 4, we read a command that God gave to Joshua who then gave it to the children of Israel about remembering what God had done for them. Now let me set a little bit of a stage here for you before we read Joshua 4. And that is, this was not just a hiking trip with just a few people. This was well over 100,000 people traveling together in a, in, in a caravan crossing over through a body of water on dry land. And so as we read this story, I want you to think about the mass numbers of people that are crossing, okay? Joshua chapter 4. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder. 12 stones in all, one for each of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial in the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they were there to this day. 
The priests who were carrying the ark stood in the middle of the river until all the Lord's commands that Moses had given to Joshua were carried out. Meanwhile, the people hurried across the riverbed. And when everyone was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the ark of the covenant of the Lord as the people watched. The armored warriors from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh led the Israelites across the Jordan just as Moses had directed. These armed men, about 40,000 strong, were ready for battle and the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho. That day the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all of the Israelites. And for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they revered Moses. The Lord had said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. So Joshua gave the command. As soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came up out of the riverbed and their feet were on high ground, the water of the Jordan returned and overflowed its banks as before. The people crossed the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. Then they camped at Gilgal, just east of Jericho. It was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, In the future your children will ask, What do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, This is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you all were across just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful. And so you might fear the Lord your God forever. Well, whenever we come to this particular story, there are just tremendous amount of, uh, of sermons that could be preached just from this one text. And I want to just take us through this just and pull out some of the things and relate it to our lives today. The first thing is, is that a Jordan River can be anything that is in your life that you possibly cannot get through alone. The Jordan River was, a, a, was, a, was an obstacle that was in the way of getting to where God wanted the children of Israel to be, to be able to get the promise that he made. Now let me give you a lesson on that about life. Yes, we sing the songs like standing on the promises of God. And yes, we can claim the promises of God. And the Bible is full of promises. There's even books that are about the promises of God. But I want to assure you about this. And that is, as we gain the promises of God, he has often led us through something that made sure that we knew that it was him that was actually providing the promise. We all in our lives have deserts in which we must cross. We all have the river Jordans in which we will come up to and realize and recognize that I of myself cannot do this. I cannot make this through my own. And you know what happens to a lot of people whenever they get to their Jordans and they're like, I don't need God, I can handle this. They jump in and they drown. Or the alligators get them. Or the piranhas get them. Or the snakes get them. So whenever we think about how that they got over to the other side, God could have built another ark and put them on it. God could have made them all miracle walking water people like what he did with Peter but God chose instead to once again show himself to this generation as he had the previous generation by parting the waters not just parting the waters and let me tell you I know something about where water once was you know what it leaves mud and I have been stuck in mud in my truck because I went where water used to be 
and I've been stuck in mud all the way up to my waist because I stood where water once was. But not whenever God did it. Whenever God did it, he parted the water, he blew on it and dried the ground, and they created a dust storm in the middle of the riverbed getting to the other side, over 100,000 people. You will have Jordans in your life whenever you know there was no way you could have gotten through that and you look back on it and you realize it was God. And let me tell you, when that happens, you need to set up a memorial. Not something where you can brag about, look at what I've been through, look at what I can do. But no, what God did. So then we also think about how that not only is this Jordan and their, you know, this was the Jordan for them. We have Jordans in our life. We also think about how that God brought us through those things. But we also think about the timing of this. The scripture tells us very plainly that, that, that a date of when this actually took place. Let me tell you something in my studies. And trust me, I've spent a couple of weeks in studying this. And so I've got a lot more sermon material than what I have time to preach it. So just hang with me, okay? And that is that whenever they crossed over the Jordan, on that date, it was five days prior to Passover. And you say, what's the significance about that? Passover was what happened whenever the children of Israel, way back in Egypt, and the, future, and the past generation had experienced whenever the death angel came, but whenever the death angel saw that the blood of the lamb was around the doorpost, the death angel passed over those houses, protecting all the children of Israel and the ones that God chose to protect. And he took out all the firstborn of all the, of, of all the Egyptians. Remember that story? So that date was always in a very important date to the children of Israel. Passover was going to be celebrated. But Passover wasn't something that they just waited till that day to actually get ready for. Now I want you to stay with me on this. Think about this just for a moment. Do you know what happens on December 25th? What? Okay, y'all wake up. Tell me what happens on December 25th. Christmas, exactly. Now, I got a question for you. Do you wake up on December the 25th and say, hmm, I think I'll celebrate Christmas today? Do you? Just out of curiosity, how many of you all start planning for Christmas the day after Thanksgiving? How many of y'all start before Thanksgiving? Y'all can repent and go ahead and tell me now because I live with one of those that... She starts, when did you start last year getting ready for Christmas? Fourth of July? Something like that. I mean, where, you know, it don't take long for Christmas trees to start popping up in our house, you know? The essence is this right here. We don't start on the day of Christmas to start preparation for Christmas. We begin way in advance. God let them cross over this Jordan to come up to where the promised land was five days in advance because in five days was going to be the Passover and he wanted them to be ready for that celebration. Sometimes our timing of what we think that God ought to do and when he ought to do it is not in conjunction with what God's timing is. What does that teach us? God's in control and he has a plan. And it's all in his perfect will. And his plan is going to make sure that we have plenty of preparation time. So whatever it is that God is bringing you through, because let me tell you, we all are either facing a Jordan, in a Jordan, or just coming through a, through, through a Jordan, okay? And whenever God brings us through it, there's always going to be something on the other side that he is preparing us for. I know that here in our congregation, we have many that have experienced cancer and have had to go to the cancer center. And I know that a lot of cancer centers have a bell that whenever the patient takes their last treatment or has been declared cancer free, Donna, what do they get to do? They get to ring that bell. Now, do they ring the bell because they're like, look at what I did. I cured myself. No. Do they ring the bell because they got good service like they do at Arby's? <laughs> no. They're ringing the bell because there was some victory that took place. But let me also tell you this. Whenever that bell is rung, 
Not only did they get to ring it in here for themselves, but there are other patients up and down the halls that are taking treatments. And whenever they hear that bell, it gives them some hope that one day my testimony will be, I got to ring the bell. So God may have put you in that situation at that time, not for punishment, but to be able to maybe give some encouragement to somebody else whenever you get to ring the bell, not for yourself, but for others who will hear the ringing. God will also use your testimony of whatever Jordan that you've been through to be able to sound out the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, no matter how the circumstances may have turned out for you, so that others might be able to hear it. And so whenever we think about the perfect timing of him, we also know that, that whenever God gave the instructions to, to, to Joshua, Joshua told them to go back and to pick up 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel and to bring them out. And they, they, they took them and they piled them up on, on the bank. And they, they took them on in with them so that they would have them as a place where they would always remember what God had done for them. But let me tell you about old Joshua. Joshua went back in there and Joshua took 12 stones himself and he piled them up there in the riverbed and he left them there and he came on out. And the scripture says, and Joshua wrote this whenever he was writing the book of Joshua later on, and they are still there today. How did Joshua know that the, stone, the stones that he piled up in the middle of the River Jordan was still there? Okay. I believe that he'd gone back swimming. Now, I have no proof to be able to say this, but, but to me, I could see where this happened. And that is, you see, I believe that there was the visual that was on the banks that everybody could see and everybody could observe them. They were very obvious. Just like with us, we could set up memorials and we can set up remembrances that everybody can see. Like I said a while ago, you know, whenever we've traveled, you know, we bought those little mementos, you know, and people say, oh, where'd you get that? Well, we got that when we was on this trip. And oh, I love that and everything. Well, we got it when we were here, things like that. But there are some things that are internal in which we have set up as a memorial in our own minds and our hearts, in which we go back to and we visit. And I think that Joshua swam back out there at some point, and he knew about where it was, and I don't know how deep the River Jordan was at this time, but we do know that there are flood seasons, which is where this took place because it said that it was flowing out of its banks, and there's other times whenever the River Jordan is kind of shallow. And I believe that he swam out there and he found about where it was. And he was like, I think this is about the spot. And I believe that he began to put his feet down. And then I believe that he was able to stand on top of those piles of rocks up out of the water. Why? Because he was standing on the solid rock. Now he might have done this when nobody else was looking, but he traveled back there himself. And see, and that's where some of us need to be. I know that for me, personally, my Memorial Day is February 21st. And that's the day that I go back in my mind, and I remember where I was and whenever friends of mine were killed. And I set up a time where I reflect upon that. And for years, it used to throw me into just an absolute state of depression. And then Heather and Justin got married on February 21st. So now I go back and I remember that. But I never forget those who perished on February 21st. And so we also go back and we set up memorials that are within sight of us that maybe nobody else knows about. But God met you somewhere at some time, at some place, and you need to go back there and stand back on those rocks and remember from whence you have come. Now, did you notice that whenever the people got ready to go, 
they brought the ark of the Lord, which is a symbolism of the presence of the Lord, to the river Jordan, to the banks. And then the river parted, and they brought it down into it, and they stopped. And then all the people went through, and they got to the other side. Then they brought the ark up out of the river. Now, remember this right here. The ark of the Lord represents that of the presence of the Lord. Let me give you some hope here today, okay? Stay with me on this. Whenever we're going up to our river Jordans, God's already there. Whenever we're going through the river Jordan, God's already there. And whenever we come out the other side, God is right there with us. Now this would be a place where if we were in a Pentecostal church, I would be up running around. Or at least somebody would say, Amen. Because whenever you stop and you think about this just for a moment, that no matter where I am, the presence of the Lord is always there. Even if I make my bed in Sheol, we know that his presence is even there. And so while they had a journey that was not easy traveling through to get to the other side, to be able to get to the promise God's presence was still there. Which tells me that, brothers and sisters, we need not expect an easy trip. But let us come to look for the presence of the Lord, no matter the journey. But we also are able to see that whenever they crossed over and they were that much closer to the promised land, let us be reminded that they were led by a great leader, Joshua. But Joshua was not just born a leader. Personally, let me tell you a little secret. There is no such thing as a natural born leader. Okay? There's no such thing. Some people just have a a, a greater propensity to lead. And you want me to tell you who the greatest leaders are? Those who once were great followers. You show me a good leader, I'll show you a great follower. You see, before Joshua was ever the leader, he was first a servant unto Moses. A servant. And he served Moses well. And because he was in the presence of a great leader, that he learned from that person. Let me tell you this right here. Be careful who you choose as your friends and who you hang out with. And choose for yourself some great leaders that you might be able to be around. Christian men and women that might be able to inspire you, to show you the way, and to help teach you the word. And here's where he turned from being a servant. Joshua then became Moses' protege. Where Moses then took him and and, 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 um, mentored him and to help take care of him. And then what we're able to see from this was that then when the timing was right and Moses had died, then God elevated him to being the leader in which God called him to be. Now, stay with me on this, okay? Listen, because I'm I'm fixing to get all up in your business, okay? Because I'm fixing to get all up in your house. Men, I want to talk to y'all just for a moment, okay? Ladies, y'all can take notes, but men, I'm in your face right now, okay? just as I had to be in my own face in the mirror when I was preaching this to myself. Why were those stones ever put there to begin with? It was so that the children could ask, what are those stones for? And they could be told. It was when God dried up the water and the river Jordan and allowed us to be able to cross over to get to the promised land. Men, it's our responsibility to teach our children about those stones and our lives. Men, You want to talk about how brave the men are that are willing to go to the battlefields and fight for our freedom? 
But I have a very serious problem whenever Christian men don't have a backbone of bravery in their homes to be able to stand up against sin in their own homes. It's not about how brave somebody can be whenever they pick up a rifle or driving a tank or flying in, 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 a, in an aircraft and go and fight a physical enemy. The greatest battle for us is the spiritual warfare that's going on and our kids and our grandkids need to see daddies and granddaddies and great granddaddies and uncles and brothers putting on the whole armor of God. Grow backbone, men. Become the spiritual leaders that you're supposed to be so that whenever your kids don't have to go ask the preacher spiritual questions or a Sunday school teacher a spiritual lesson or our children's minister a spiritual lesson, they are able to go and ask daddy the spiritual questions. Now, I know that's really strong. But I'm tired of giving out milk toast. I'm ready to see some men take action. So how do we do that? First off, men. Go back and look at the Jordans you got through. And do not feel, well, I want to be able to tell my kids what I've done. I want to be able to tell my kids what I've accomplished, what I came through, the victories that I've had and everything. And you totally ignore God? The Bible says if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due season, he will lift us up. So don't try to make yourself out the hero, but instead, make God the center of your life and share where it was God that did this and God that did that. And while I did not understand it, I still walked with God and God was able to provide all these things. And men, this is why we're losing a generation of children today to the humanist. I don't fear the atheist as much as what I do the humanist because there's not enough Christian men that are willing to say, let me show you God in my life. And so they put up those memorials, those stones, so the kids could go back and ask about it. And so men, I want to encourage you to do this. Set up some memorials in your life and in your home. But don't make for yourself carven images that they become idols. You know what could be a great memorial? When your kids and your grandkids see you reading the Bible. Whenever they see you on your knees praying. Whenever they are able to hear how you handle situations with a biblical answer. When they see you being led by the Holy Spirit, that whenever you're doing it different from how the rest of the world is doing it and how the rest of the world is telling you that it ought to be done, that's how you know. And so we want to put up those memorials in our lives. And it was because Joshua had a future. See, whenever he crossed over, he crossed over 40,000 warriors because there were more warriors in Jericho. But Joshua had the hope that there was going to be a future generation that would be able to look back at those stones. So let's set up some things for our future generations. You see, that's the communion. And, and that is that some of those things are seen and some of those things are not seen, just like the stones. The crucifixion on the cross was seen. But then Jesus coming alive inside the tomb itself was not seen, but we saw the evidence of it because the stone was rolled away. And because the angel appeared and the guards fainted. And whenever they came, they, when the women came, they saw the linen cloths that were there and there was an empty tomb. The evidence is on it. Remembrance is so important. So as we get ready to do this in remembrance of him, I want us to pause right here and listen to a song as we prepare ourselves 
spiritually to be able to do this in remembrance of him. As we partake of this Lord's Supper, the communion, remember his sacrifice. And may this be a stone in our lives to go back and look about the stone that was rolled away. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when, the, when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus and for his body that was given for us as a sacrifice so that we could have 
forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, God, that it was paid in, in whole and it was complete. And now, Father, I pray that we would remember his body as a remembrance in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of the wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Let us pray. Father God, not only do we thank you for his body, but we also thank you for his blood. The blood of the spotless lamb, the blood that knew no sin, that washed away all of our sins. Thank you, God, for providing for us in such a powerful way, allowing us to be able to have a relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Do this in remembrance of me for as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes. I pray that this Memorial Day will be a day that which we will truly reflect upon the freedoms that we have in our nation and the price in which it cost. But let us also be reminded of the freedoms that which we have in Christ. But let us remember the price that was paid for those freedoms. And if you do not know this man named Jesus and you've never had a relationship with him, Will you talk to me immediately after the services? I'll be in the parking lot. You can also reach me through Facebook Messenger, or you can always call me. I'd love to talk with you about your journey with Christ. Let us stand as we get ready to sing our closing song. And uh, as Michael's finding that, we're going, to, uh, we're going to go ahead and pronounce the benediction. We ready to sing? Let's sing, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. Go ahead, Mike. Blessed be. 